Hello and welcome to chapter 11. This is Professor Farhad. In this chapter, we would look at evaluating MPV estimates in this session, but the whole chapter is about project analysis and evaluation. So we're going to start by looking at NPV. So NPV is the net present value. We spoke, we discussed NPV in prior chapters several times. So if you don't know what NPV is, by all means, go to the prior chapters and look at NPV, specifically chapter 9. In this chapter, we're going to start by defining a term called forecasting risk. What is a forecasting risk? Well, what we're doing is forecasting, and every time we forecast, forecast is basically looking at the future. What could happen? You could be wrong. So every time you forecast, every time you make an estimate, there is an inherent risk that you might be wrong. Okay, so what is forecasting risk? It's the possibility that we will make a bad decision because of errors in the projected cash flow. That's called the forecasting risk. Remember what we do when we when we work with NPV, we have cash flow that we're discounting to the present value to, to the to the present, which is using the present value technique, discounted it till today. So if those are incorrect, then our NPV will be incorrect, okay? So this is called forecasting risk or estimation risk. Because of the forecasting risk, there's a danger that we will think a project that has a positive NPV when it really it does not, okay? Or it could be the opposite, or it could be the opposite. How is that possible? It happens if we are, all, if we are overly optimistic about the future, and as a result, cash flow don't realistically reflect the possible future cash flow. That, remember, the the opposite could be true. You might think that a project has a negative NPV, but indeed it has a positive. Also what happened here is you lost a good opportunity. So there's a forecasting risk in both direction, okay? But really you want to be very careful. So how do we deal with forecasting risk? So one way to deal with forecasting risk is to do, is to work with scenarios and other what if analysis. So let's take a look at how do we, kind of try to reduce our risk or try to pinpoint our risk, okay? Let's assume we're investigating a new project. Naturally, the first thing to do is to estimate NPV based on the projected cash flow. This is what we learned. We'll call this initial, initial set of projection the, the base case, not the best case, the base. We're going we're gonna to be working with the best case and the worst case, but this is called the base. So this is what we're going to start with. This is the base. However, we recognize the possibility of errors in these cash flow projections. So obviously, when we make projection, there's always the possibility of us making an error. After completing the, ba the base case, we thus wish to investigate the impact of different assumptions about the future of our estimate. So what we, what we can do, we can start with a base case. For example, suppose we forecast sales at 100 units per year. Now, this is the base case. Then what we can do, we can have an an upper and a lower bound. We know that this estimate might be high or low, but we are relatively certain it is not off by more than 10 units in either direction. So simply put, if, we, if we're starting with a base of 100, we can say, based on our knowledge of the product, the industry, the economy, you know, we could sell up to 110 or we could sell at least at 90. So we have an upper and a lower range. Okay, so what we did when we picked the upper and lower bound, we are not ruling out the possibility that the actual value could be outside this range. Of course, because you don't know the future, but this is what you think is going to happen. What are we saying again, loosely speaking, is that it's unlikely that the true average of the possible values is outside this range. Okay, as opposed to the estimated average. So let's take a look at an example to see how this whole thing works. So we will work an example and see how does it work. So let's start with this data. So to illustrate, let's look at this project. It has a cost of $200,000, has a five-year life, and no salvage value. Depreciation is a straight line to zero. So we're going to fully depreciate the asset, and the required rate of return is 12%. The tax rate is 34%. So here's what we have for this example. So let's take a look at the data that we are giving. So the base case, this is what we talked about. The base case is we're going to sell 6,000 units. The price per unit, it's going to be $60. So we're going to sell each, price, each unit at $60. The variable cost is 
60 uh, the, the selling is 80 the variable cost is 60 and there is a fixed cost of 50,000 before we go to the lower and upper bound let's go ahead and calculate what should be our net income so basically sales it's going to be 6,000 times $80 and that's going to give us 480,000 variable cost which we did not talk about variable cost yet but variable cost is a cost that varies with with sales so if, the, if we sell more units the more of that cost we will have so if we're selling 6,000 unit and for every unit we have a variable cost of $60 again we'll talk about variable cost a little bit more in the next session just know we're gonna take now 6,000 units times $60 that's our variable cost then we subtract our fixed cost which is giving fixed cost means a cost a cost that that, that should not a change then we subtract depreciation and depreciation is based on the asset that we bought we bought an asset of 200,000 and we said it's going to last us four or five years so every year we're going to take a forty thousand dollar in depreciation that's going to give us EBIT which is we we learned this from chapter two then from EBIT we're going to multiply it by 34 percent that's the taxes we're going to pay taxes taxes of ten thousand two hundred and that's going to be our net income from now from net income what can we do from EBIT what can we do from EBIT we can calculate our operating cash flow which is OCF equal to EBIT plus taxes minus I'm sorry not plus that will be nice minus taxes plus depreciation so thirty thousand dollar in EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes so that's gonna give us fifty nine thousand eight hundred dollar per year that's the operating cash flow now what we do is we discount it at 12 percent the factor is 3.6048 then what we do is we find out our base case npv not best base which is 15,567 so this is the base case scenario now what can we do we can do the same thing for the lower bound and the upper bound and what does that mean it means we can run the same analysis preparing an income statement basically we have different all we have to do is a different price a different variable cost but under this scenario and we're selling only 5,500 unit and the fixed cost is 45,000 and we can have an upper range if we want upper bound and do the same thing now we're, can, we're gonna do also the additional combination but this is what we're heading so so you know where we're heading okay so what is a scenario analysis so let's take a look at scenario analysis a scenario analysis f is a form of what if analysis what if means let's make some changes to the numbers and see what would happen what we do is investigate the changes in our MPV estimate that result from asking questions like what if the unit sales realistically should be projected at 5,500 instead of 6,000? This is what we're doing. Once we start looking at alternative scenarios, so let's let's keep going here. So once we start looking at alternative scenarios, we might find that most of the plausible ones result in positive MPV. In this case, if that's the case, we have some confidence in proceeding with the project. So what we do is we look at different scenarios, and if they're all given us positive MPV, it means under any scenario, assuming those scenarios are realistic, then we should definitely go with the project. If a substantial percentage of the of the scenarios look bad, so if we're working some, like for example, three of the five scenarios, we could have negative MPV, then we have to be very careful. So the degree of forecasting risk is high, and further investigation is in order. Okay, we can consider. A number of possible scenarios so you don't have to have five six you could have more a good place to start is the worst case scenarios what you do is say here's what could happen and it's be it should be considered my worst case scenario this will tell us the, the minimum MPV of the project if this turns out to be positive well guess what then this is great okay while we are at it we will go ahead and determine the other extreme best case scenario okay and that will be the upper bound of our MPV so what we do is we'll work what, what we consider the worst case scenario the best case scenario and if the worst case scenario still give us a positive NPV then we should be very happy okay to get the worst case scenario here's what we do this is the worst case scenario like everything is pessimistic we assign the least favorable values to each item what's the least favorable values well for example the units what's gonna be the lowest 
number of units. So this means low, va low value for the item of units sold. So the units will be the lowest and the cost will be the highest. So this way we'll make sure we're, we're looking at the worst case scenario. Then we do, rever we do the reverse for the best case scenario. So what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario, we sell 5,500 rather than 6,000. Our selling price is 75 rather than rather than 85 and the variable cost is 62 rather than 58 okay so what we're doing here under this worst case scenario we're giving the we are, we are looking at the worst scenario <laughs> that's basically what it is then the base the best case scenario we're doing the opposite we're saying what if we sold 6500 selling it at 85 dollars and the variable cost is the lowest at 58 and the fixed cost obviously is lowest than the worst case scenario now those are the worst and the, the worst and the best case and we have also don't forget we also have a base worst best and we could have a combination of many different scenarios but those are as i said something reasonable base worst case being very pessimistic and be, being very optimistic so with this information, we can calculate net income and cash flow under each of these scenarios. So you could obviously check yourself if you want to, but this is what's going to happen. Under the best case scenario, your net income, I'm sorry, your base, which we already did this. We already did the base scenario. This one we did. But we didn't calculate IRR. IRR is 15.5. Net present value is 15,000. We already did this one. So now, worst case scenario, and hopefully your net income works out to be 15,000 basically do the same thing that I did earlier negative 15,510 this is your net income your cash flow will be 24,000 positive cash flow will be positive per year net present value is negative 111,000 you're gonna lose most of your money Clo close to half of it and the IRR is negative 14.4 under the best case scenario, and you have, you, you, here you have to be very careful, your net income should be 59,730. Again, if you want to try this yourself, the cash flow is, and what do I mean by this? Just try it yourself. It means take, take this information and run the income statement and do the cash flow the same thing as I did, as I did in the prior example. The cash flow is 99,730, pretty good. Net present value 159,504, and my IRR or my return is 40% of the project. So this, those are the three scenarios. So what do we learn uh, under the worst scenario? The cash flow is still positive. That's good news, okay? The bad news is the return is negative and the MPV is negative. Okay, because the project costs 200000 we stand to lose a little more than half of the original investment, which is that's bad. The best case scenario offers an attractive return of 41%. Okay. So, let's take a look at... Um, so, so, the term... So this is just basically terminology. The term best and worst case are commonly used and we'll stick with them, but they are somewhat misleading. The absolute best thing that could happen would be something unlikely, such as launching a new idea and subsequently learning that our, for example, here soda just happens to cure the common cold. That will be great, okay? Or we could have a worst case scenario like in April of 2010, BP, the British Petroleum, Gulf of Mexico oil rig, Deepwater Horizon got fired and sank, and sank following an explosion leading to a massive oil spill, which in turn incurred the company $43 billion in cost for cleanup and lawsuit settlement. So you could have a, a best and, and worst, but instead of best and worst, it's more accurate to use when we're optimistic and pessimistic. In broad terms, if we're thinking about a reasonable range, say unit sales and what we call the best case would be corresponding with something near the upper end of the range the worst case would simply correspond to the lower okay now not all companies um publish all three estimates for example there's a company in the textbook called el Madden minerals made a press release with information concerning its el gold project in british columbia and there's a table they're showing you the base the base case the base case this is the the project summary okay so you could look at this in your textbook this is basically the company is publishing this information what else can we do beside what if analysis we can do 
sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis. And let's take a look at what we mean by sensitive sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis is a variation of the scenario analysis, and the scenario is the what if what if analysis. It's use it's useful in pinpointing areas where forecasting risk is especially severe. When the for when you think there's a lot of risk of you making a mistake in your forecasting, you would use sensitivity analysis. The basic idea with sensitivity analysis is to freeze all variables except one, and then see how esti how how sensitive our estimate to MPV is to changes in that one variable. So what you do is you change one variable at a time and you want to see that variable, how much of that variable affect the overall picture. And the more that variable affect the overall picture, either negatively or positively, the more um, weight you should give that variable. And our MPV estimate, uh, if our MPV estimate turns out to be very sensitive to relatively small changes in projected value of the component of projected cash flow, then the forecasting risk associated with cash flow is is high. So if we think cash flow is the one that's really uh, uh, making the largest effect on uh, NPV, then we have to assign it a high risk. Therefore, we need further investigation. To illustrate how sensitive analysis work, we can go back to our base case for every item except unit sales, then we can calculate cash flow and MPV using the largest and the smallest unit figures. So what we do is, again, we keep unit sales the same, and we, we, can, we can have, we can run various scenarios. We can run various scenarios, okay? Now we freeze everything except fixed costs and repeat the analysis. So basically you freeze everything except fixed costs. So in a, in a sensitivity analysis, you want to know each item, each value in the analysis, how much does it affect NPV? And the higher it affects the NPV, the higher value you would give that item, the higher value you would give that item. Okay, one more thing, we have what's called simulation analysis. Again, what if scenario analysis, simulation analysis is kind of a combination of both. Scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis are widely used, just what we what we learned earlier, with scenario analysis, which is this is new. We let all different variable changes, then we let them let them take only on few values. So what we're looking for is now we're looking with we're working with all the variables. With sensitivity analysis, we let only one variable, but we let it on take on many values. If we combine the two approaches, the result is a crude form of simulation analysis. So simulation analysis is changing a lot of things all at the same time. Okay. If we want to let all items vary at the same time, we have to consider a very large number of scenarios and computer assistance is almost certainly needed. In its simplest case, we start with unit sales and assume that, that any value in our 5,000 to 6,500 range is equally likely and we start by randomly picking one value, okay? Then we randomly pick a price, a variable cost, and so on. So simulation, it will it will give you many, many different scenarios combining both simulation, uh, combining both simulation, uh, com combining scenario and sensitive and sensitivity analysis, okay? Once we have values for all the relevant components, we calculate an MPV. We repeat the sequence as much as we desire, probably several thousand times. The result is many MPV estimate that we can summarize by calculating the average value and some measure of how spread out the different possibilities are. And the more they're spread out, as we would learn later, the higher the standard deviation, the more risk the project has. For example, it would be of some interest to know what percentage of the possible scenarios result in negative MPV. So how many of these various scenarios result in negative MPVs. And the more negative MPVs we have, the riskier is the project to start with. Okay, because simulation analysis is an extended form of, of scenario analysis, it has it has the same problem. Once we have the results, no simple decision rule tells us what to do. Okay, also we have described in relatively simple form the uh, of simulation. Okay, to really do it right, we could have to, we, we would have to consider the interrelationship between the different cash flow components. So it's so you're never going to have a specific a specific answer. Okay. Um, furthermore, we assume that the possible values were equally likely to occur. It's probably more realistic to assume that the values near the base are more likely than the extreme values, but. Coming up with the probabilities is difficult to say the least. Of course, the more we are closer to the base, the more comfortable with the, we are with the project. So if most of the 
output of the scenario shows us that we're closer to the base NPV than we're more comfortable. For these, scenario, for these reasons, the use of simulation is somewhat limited in practice. However, recent advances in computer software and hardware lead us to believe it may become more common in the future, particularly for large-scale projects. Because if you have a computer software working with this, it will be easier to calculate all these ranges. So this is basically... Um, uh, this session, uh, the next session we're going to work with is something called the break-even analysis. And as I told you, in the break-even, we'll talk about a little bit more about the variable cost. We'll talk about also the fixed cost. If you have any questions, by all means, email me.